Welcome back. Welcome to another episode of the Bonsai Stuff podcast. From me, Scott Martin, from Bonsai Matsu in lockdown Melbourne, Victoria, Australia. It's uh, it's awkward times at the moment, but it's really positive too because we're uh, we're about to hit spring in a few weeks, mid August now. As I look around the workshop from wall to wall to wall, all I can see is uh, is the pines that have been repotted and the junipers and all the trees that have been given that little bit of rejuvenation that they so wellingly deserve and I'm waiting for them now to to do their thing when spring gets here the buds will start extending and then a different type of work will commence but for now it's all about sore hands and dirt everywhere and making sure that those new pots that have been purchased throughout the year finally get used and the trees maybe get a bit of a, a bit of a new look and new feel about them so it's a uh, it's always good times Repotting, I, I do enjoy it immensely. I think it's one of the most important things that we can do with our bonsai is to make sure that we focus heavily on the roots, which there translates into the the strength and health of the tree somewhere down the track. So, repotting, not daunting, great, messy, sore hands, long nights, but you know it's the window of opportunity that we have to make sure that we can uh, we can get it done. So. Strap yourself in. It's going to be a good podcast. This one, um, I want to, I want to make sure that you guys get something thoroughly enjoyable out of it, and uh, and I'm looking forward to it. So, enjoy. So I was watching football the other day and there was a young player pretty inexperienced it was his debut game and he made a made a shocking mistake which was which is fair enough you know you're entitled to make mistakes but one of the commentators said when the fundamentals are incorrect you're not giving yourself a chance and I thought that really applies to us too with bonsai so you know, you can look at refinement and uh, and and high-end techniques and that sort of thing but really it's the the fundamentals if you can't get the fundamentals right then really you don't stand a chance you know, so repotting you know you want to make sure that you're maximizing the strength through the roots of the tree which is really important it's so easy to overlook or to to skimp or or cut corners when you're repotting with the medium that you're using or just looking at getting the tree into the pot where and you know you're not you're not working the roots correctly and you're just shoving the tree in there tying it in if you even tie it in and then uh, then moving on to the next phase to make the tree look pretty but without that real fundamental focus on the roots of the tree you've got no chance you're not going to you're not going to take the step in the direction that you need you know we look at resource allocation too you know it's balancing the strength via pruning or, or plucking it's that's a real fundamental and that's what you're doing you're not if you take away your focus from from pruning to make things look pretty and you're looking to balance the tree and that's the ultimate goal of, of bonsai always is to have a balanced tree to have each region of the tree at the same level of strength and use of trees resources that's 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 a that's a real win if you can get that right then the design stuff becomes a lot easier whereas if you're just pruning things to look pretty, then really you know, you're, you're going to miss out longer term. Watering, watering. I can't, I can't iterate how important watering is. It's, you know, as we head into our growing season here in in Melbourne, in Australia, watering becomes more and more uh, important and critical that you get it right. And you've got to have, you've got to have that skill set behind you. You know, not watering a beautiful bonsai. He's not going to keep it a beautiful bonsai for very long. Feeding, we've got to make sure that you feed your trees. Understanding the feeding process, you know, it, breaking it down. Is your, is your tree in development or is it in refinement stage? You know, when should I fertilise? How much should I fertilise? What should I fertilise? The internet's a, a broad place and I'm, I'm sure that you'll find, you know, an, an article somewhere or someone that tells you that using the remains of a... Portuguese duck will be the best source of fertiliser you can get for your bonsais, whether it is or whether it isn't. It's not what I'm what I'm here to debate. But what I think you need to do is I think you need to do your research and and check out local growers that are doing things really well in your local area and 
maybe ask the question, hey, what do you fertilize? When do you fertilize? You know, what should I do with this tree? Especially if you're not, uh, haven't got many years of, of bonsai, or you might have a lot of years of bonsai development under your, under your wing, but, you know, maybe the trees could be, could be better. And I think focusing in on how to make them better, you know, focusing on the fundamentals of feeding, you know, should be, should be a primary, primary goal. Repeatedly doing the same thing over and over and expecting different results is just crazy. It's it's not going to work. It's a definition of stupidity. You need to, if you want to take your bonsai to the next level, then you need to do things differently and you need to be open to suggestions. You need to, to take on as much education and learning as you possibly can from from those that you, know, you should listen to. A lot of people out there and, you know, just because they're the loudest doesn't mean they're the most correct. I'd really be really be mindful on where you take your uh, where you take your advice from and that that should come from you know if you if you like what you see and what's presented then yeah by all means ask the question if not you know enjoy scroll move on positioning another basic fundamental that i see you know, really gets it's messed up a lot of the time you know positioning for sun for airflow for exposure to the elements you know over sheltering your trees is is Far worse than overexposure for your trees. They need to be need to be grown and treated like they're a tree. You know, just because you put them in a pot doesn't make them doesn't make them special. When it gets to pest and disease, you know, make sure that you're on the front foot. When there's a problem, treat it, but then always backtrack to work out what caused the problem and and, and how can you prevent it from happening next time. There's always there's always a root cause for something going wrong with your trees. And you need to make sure that you invest the time in researching it and fixing it, learning from any mistakes that that might that might fall fall down. Design and styling always comes later. It's always the fundamentals that should be the primary focus of of all of us. And even when you've got a beautiful tree and its design is exactly what you want, and you know that's the one that you go to first and and puts a smile on your face. Well you've still got to treat it with utmost respect for the fundamentals. You know, you, you need to go through all of those things that we've talked about to make sure that you're giving yourself and the bonsai the best opportunity it possibly can have. Right, so we're coming towards the end of repotting season. It's been a long couple of months, I can tell you. There's a lot of trees that have been uh, been pushed through the workshop, but as I said, it's it's all worth it. Every single piece of root that's been cut off, and every piece of potting medium that's been been put into place with a chopstick, the hours and hours and hours of work that have gone into it. Uh, I'll see the results of that and the reward from that for the next you know, years, years to come. So, uh, while repotting is really important, repotting aftercare is just as important, if not more important, than how how you treat the tree and how um, how you manage it going forward after it's had its its roots hacked. You know, once you've taken off that portion of roots, you know, twenty five, thirty percent, whatever it is. It's come out of a black tub into a bonzo pot, maybe even more. You know, 70 percent of the roots have come off. You can't just expect that that tree to go back to its its previous state. You know, there's going to be a period of shock for the tree, and how you manage that is really, really super important. You need the tree to settle and start to grow before you expose it to the elements. So for me, my process is to keep them in a sheltered spot. For me, it's my workshop. It's an indoor room, there's large glass doors, but there's no no exposure to direct sunlight, there's no exposure to wind, there's no exposure to temperature fluctuations. It's a very calm, static environment. The air conditioner or heater doesn't get run in that room, it's just very, very mild. So there's, there's very little chance of the tree being disturbed in any way. And I like to think of it like, you know, it's, it's a chance for the tree to just stop catch its breath, work out where it's at in the cycle of life and suddenly then start to push roots and push new foliage. Once I see that new uh, new foliage starting to come, I'll then 
take that as an indication that the roots are starting to grow, you know, that one-to-one -one ratio. So as the foliage grows, the roots are going to grow also. So the healing process is starting to occur below the soil surface. I always use a, a, a light layer of sphagnum moss on top of the on top of the medium. I do that for a number of reasons. Um, one is it protects the surface roots, so it allows them to, to grow. With the medium that I use, it's a very open mix, um, scoria, pumice, pine nuggets, and they're all all sort of you know five to ten mil in size. So there's there's quite um, there's quite an open uh, area for the for the roots to grow below the soil surface. But at the surface, a lot of air can get there, and where the air can get into the mix, the roots won't grow. So I find the sphagnum being on top of the mix allows the roots almost to come directly to the very surface of the pot, which means that my my real estate that I've got for roots to grow in is maximised to the pot. I also use it as a telltale. So once you've repotted the trees and you water them, the sphagnum turns a nice sort of orangey colour. It stays that way while there's moisture still in the sphagnum. As the tree starts to take up water, as the as the roots start to grow and as the tree starts to wake up from the from the dormancy period, then the sphagnum starts to turn to a lighter shade and head towards the white original colour that it was when it was first first chopped up. So I use the sphagnum as a telltale for me to say, okay, well, the tree needs water now after repotting because it's starting to dry out. Then when I see that starting to happen day on day and the tree is then starting to get aggressively growing and there's foliage to match and, and the, the roots are, are taking up moisture and the sphagnum is drying on a very regular basis, that's when I'll slowly start the exposure process. I call it day release. I'll take the trees outside during the day, put them out on the bench, let them get exposed to the air movement, to the sun, partial sun, whatever it is. And then at night time, as the temperature starts to drop, I'll pick the tree up and I'll bring it back into the workshop. Next day, I'll do the same thing. And I'll do that for about a week. And then after that, I'll move them up onto the bench, the growing bench. And they'll be put into a sheltered spot under some shade cloth underneath another tree or somewhere where they're not going to get full exposure, but they get that sort of 80% exposure to the elements. Then a few weeks later on, growth should be out there, should be starting to harden off. So it's not the, the fine, delicate growth that we get with our initial spring burst. And once I start to see that, then shade cloth starts to get withdrawn because by then the frosts have disappeared. But for us in Melbourne, uh, the frosts are still uh, still coming. I looked at the weather forecast last night and there's, there's cold weather coming overnight in the next couple of days. So it's um, you've got to be vigilant with it. If you just turn your back on the on the weather, then you'll, uh, you'll possibly pay the price. You know, the trees always have limited resources and you want to make sure that the use of those resources is maximised. So if you put the tree out into the frost, tree gets flogged, leaves get burnt, fine delicate branches die, waste of resources, tree's got to go back to step one, start regrowing again and push on. So if you want to get the most out of your trees, you've got to be vigilant in how you manage their exposure to the elements, especially during this early time, uh, just, just, after, just after repotting. Also make sure that I give the trees sea salt. Now this is a, a liquid seaweed uh, tonic. It's not uh, not exposure to sea salt or anything like that. It's sea sol. So um, it's a product that we have available here in Australia, which which works very well to um, to help stabilize the trees and get them through the the shock of of repotting. No fertilizer, no fertilizer until um, until I start to see something happening in the in the growing season. And uh, as transpiration kicks on, the tree starts to move and then it's exposed to the elements. And that's when, you know, that exposure happens. And depending on what stage the tree's at with fertilising, fertilising's, you know, not, not for now, that's for a, that's for a later podcast. The, uh, the fertilising stage happens and depending on the, the stage of development of the tree will determine the fertiliser that it gets. But anyway, like I said, that's for another time. So repotting aftercare is really, really super important. If you don't have a workshop or something like that then you know a, a garage can be a nice place um somewhere on a on a deck under a shelter a, a, a roof where it stops the exposure to that frost keep it out of the sunlight for a little bit you know let, let the tree just catch its breath then i guarantee you once the tree starts to starts to push and starts to gain strength that's when you'll start to see the results 
So, like all good bonzo people, I'm always on the hunt for new trees, new stock, you know, having, having all these online platforms and social medias where people can post trees that they've collected or selling and stuff like that. It always makes your heart flutter a little bit when you see one, but I'm hoping that what I can, what I can sow next might save you a little bit of heartache and, and a few bucks. And this, is, this comes from experience. Not all stocks are equivalent. Yeah, some good, the good collectors will collect a tree, put it away, let it recover its strength. Then, only then, once it's got the uh, the appropriate root structure and and it's you know almost guaranteed of surviving the process, then the tree will be passed on for sale. But that can be that can be years down the track. You know, so good collectors don't just rip a tree out of the ground, throw it into a tub. And then flog the thing for top dollar, where some poor, some poor enthusiast shells out hard-earned coin and uh, and doesn't get very much in return for a tree that you know possibly is just a just a stump in a in a pot with some dirt. So please uh, please be careful. Some of the questions I'd be asking would would be how long ago was it collected? How many seasons has it been through? What was the collecting process? What have you done to it after it's been collected? Don't just uh, don't just let the uh, the rush of blood because something looks nice make you uh, make you jump into jump into shelling out those uh, those hard earned dollars for something which is almost certainly not going to survive the process. You know the mortality rate of uh, of trees that are collected depending on the species, depending on the the collector. They can vary drastically, and you know it might be um, might be worthwhile tracking through a bit of the uh, the history on on the the collector as well as on the tree itself to see whether it's um, whether it's worth making that investment. Investing into something which is guaranteed or not surviving is it's not really an investment. It's a, it's a waste of money. So good stock is can be hard to find, but you'll you'll often find that the price of of, of good stock where it's had the correct amount of work done on it, you know, you'll you'll pay for it because someone's investing time and effort into into making that tree survive and and to be able to become a bonsai long term. And that's where nursery prices vary. So, you know, two trees that pretty much look the same. You know, one's one's been had its roots worked for for ten fifteen years is worth a lot more than a tree that's just come out of the ground and put into a pot. But I I'd, I'd almost guarantee that the one that's had its roots worked for a long period of time is going to be a much better tree longer term and that's where I would think about investing my money in that that pile as opposed to the the other pile where it's going to uh, it's going to end in end in heartache So time for what's on the bench. All right, so with this uh, this episode, I want to talk about hawthorns. You know, having talked about collected trees and stuff like that, one of the uh, one of the common ones that gets collected in Australia is uh, hawthorns, and they make excellent bonsai. There's so much to like about them, so much to love about the character of a hawthorn, except for the spikes, which uh, which invariably draw blood. But they they flower, they get little red berries on them. They're uh, they're quite easy to collect. They're quite a hardy tree. They've got beautiful bark, which flakes and and really has great character to it. They'll back bud. They uh, they can develop branching quite easily from from random spots. They do take a fair bit of work because of their their growth can be can be quite coarse, and it's hard to get some some of the finer ramified uh, structure on the trees, but you can still get it. You just need to be need to be on top of it with the pruning process. They can look a bit a bit hedgy, uh, which can be a downside to them. But just need to make sure that you're constantly on the the pruning for the for the trees. And when uh, when you do let a sacrifice branch grow as well, they they do thicken quite fast. So I've got one at the moment that I'm working on a lower branch, which started as a bud last year and. And this year, the, the branch is about you know a meter long, so it's really, 
really developing quite quite quickly, which is great. And they get uh, they get nice little nobbles on them, and nothing's nothing's perfect with them. And they carve well. They got great. Uh, they can get some great dead wood on them on them as well. I was working on one uh, the other week, which is an enormous tree. And before I uh, before I went to go and start work for the day, I woke up dreaming about the thing, which um, which which hasn't happened for a while. But you know, to find that I've still got that um, that passion and that that drive to to work on a species like a hawthorn is great. You know, getting the carving tools out and and wiring, and then coming home and putting band aids all over yourself because <laughs> you've been cutting. Well, you know, that's what it is. And and I was thinking about them and, and what do I like about them and it's the, the perfection of imperfection with these things. You know, they are they aren't a perfect species and they're not um, not classical like a Japanese maple is, but the imperfection is what makes it perfect for me. I love them. You know, they're really a really exciting tree. So if you can get your hands on some uh, on especially a collected tree because they do um do put out some really gnarly shapes. If you can get yourself one that's got uh, that's, that's that's been dug well and and managed well, then you know, I'd strongly suggest it because they they sort of suit a lot of different styles as well. You know, formals, informals, you know, cascading. They uh, they seem to they seem to tick the boxes for a lot of different different shapes and designs, and, and they're a very hardy tree that respond well to to what we do here. So I would uh, I would suggest strongly uh, strongly getting onto hawthorns. So that brings us to the end of another podcast. Thanks for tuning in, as always. It's uh, it's greatly appreciated, and I do appreciate all the, the comments and feedback and that so many people enjoy it around the world. It's uh, it's very enjoyable for me to to know that you know, one little snippet or, or piece of information I pass on hopefully helps helps you as an enthusiast carry on and enjoy, enjoy bonsai that little bit more, which is very rewarding. So uh, keep at it, keep, uh, keep strong, and... You know, every time I, I work on my trees, I feel like my heart rate lowers a little bit. So in a, in a world of, of different stresses and, and uncertain times, you know, bonsai is the great foundation that we've all got. So please enjoy your trees. Please uh, please keep up with doing the best that you possibly can with what you've got. If I can help in any way, please let me know. Get in touch via the socials, uh, Instagram, Facebook, uh, email scott at bonzomatsu.com or via the website bonzomatsu.com i'm always happy to uh to stay in 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 touch with you and and uh look after yourselves be back soon enjoy the podcast and uh and see you later bye